So we're going we're gonna to have a look at what we think uh, the, the blockchain might be doing about this. Um, and very pleased to have you guys on stage today. Thanks very much for coming. I'll let you introduce yourself from, from the end. You've got a fantastic shirt on. Why, thank you. Mike Novogratz, I'm the chairman and CEO of Galaxy. Love being here in the kingdom. My name is Brad Garlinghouse. I'm the CEO of Ripple, and uh, very good to be here. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Nicholas Carey. I'm the co-founder and vice chairman of blockchain.com. Great. So let's lay out the current landscape of block blockchain technology. I want to know how it's being deployed and how deeply it's being integrated into the financial industry. Lots of conversations on the side uh, of this conference about it, but I'd love to hear uh, from, from you guys how, how you're seeing it, Start starting just here. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think it's important to take a quick step and look back a little bit. Um, yesterday morning, we had sort of some titans from the traditional finance industry uh, speak and opine about the future of finance. And it was pretty, um, it was a window into the past from my perspective. We've gotten really good at organizing molecules and we put down a lot of infrastructure in the last century that was incredibly important for human advancement. We put down roads, we put down pipes, we built hospitals and built bridges. That was all incredibly necessary. But over the next decade and into the next century, we're going to get I need to get really good at organizing electrons. One of the most important things we can do is uh, build a financial fabric for the world. Sorry, my mic is cutting in and out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the most important things we can do is wrap the planet in an economic fabric that makes it possible for all people to participate in trading and exchanging wealth. And it needs to work as fast as the internet does so that we can build new businesses, uh, exchange ideas, and coordinate capital. And Ray Dalio really hit it on the mark when he talked about the latent potential of human possibility. And if we unlock that, if a young man who's just living a mile away has an idea that he can build a better business for his community and he can source capital for that idea from anywhere, we're going to be on to some really incredible ideas from the rest of the world. And so the real vision for what's happening in the industry today um, is really to build a better financial system, one that's graphed into the internet that empowers all people to control their wealth. And there's some big ideas in there, but that's kind of where we are right now. And, and we've got some great people on the panel today that can talk both about what's happening um, beyond just the extraordinary innovations in the design of money, but also how existing institutions can marry themselves up with this technology for all kinds of other benefits. So I'll pass it on to Brad because I know his uh, firm is doing and a while, lot. And while we space. pass it on to Brad, I might get somebody to come help you with your mic. Thank so you. So Brad, you take it away. Well, so I think your question is perfect because I, I, I do think that some of the origins of blockchain and crypto were all about creating a separate, almost parallel financial system. And I think even as this panel and the structure has talked about the metaverse, I think about it really as the connective bridges. The, the, it's not about a separate financial system. It's how do we use these technologies to improve the existing financial system? Ripple has been focused on selling into financial institutions for five, six years. We have hundreds of institutions. Just yesterday, we announced the first corridor between the Middle East and the US dollar using digital assets to facilitate real-time money movements. Mm -hmm. We see this vision of a really enabling an internet of value. We talk about an internet of things, an internet of information that we live in today. And as Nick was introducing, I think that the future will enable the free flow of value in a way that truly is more inclusive and more democratizing to an, an, an economy that has fewer borders and includes more people. We're already seeing that, right, in, in parts of the uh, world. Lots of parts of the world are already in using this technology. For sure. I mean, I think one of the things, uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, this is the, well, the first time I have been to FII, and I think it's indicative of the, the trend line of crypto that we have a panelist of three very senior people in the crypto industry on stage here. And it, you know, the trend line overall is more people, more countries, more regulatory clarity, uh, more countries understanding how these can be leveraged to actually benefit their economies. I think the origins of, hey, it's for illicit purposes has really started to move into the background. So, Mike, where's the industry headed from here? What are the new players? Who are they going to emerge? And who's going to be the winners and losers? Sure. Let me step back for one second. Um, you know, I started investing in Bitcoin and in crypto in 2012. And like many of you, I'm sure, wasn't a computer science major uh, or even a technologist. And so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why everyone was so excited. And if there's one thing to remember uh, 
what Satoshi Nakamoto with this white paper that was all about Bitcoin did, his contribution was he created the first digital signature you couldn't counterfeit. And that sounds simple, the first digital signature. Before that, you take your computer and you saw any digital image, you could copy, paste, and make a thousand of them or a million of them. And so what Satoshi did was he allowed Bitcoin to be unique, a Bitcoin to be unique. There are 21 million you can't, you can't make any more. We know there's a unique digital signature. And that idea has spread from first digital money, which then transformed into digital gold, which is Bitcoin, to all kinds of things. And so the most exciting thing that happened this year, and I think everyone has to pay attention to, is things called NFTs. We saw digital art, digital collectibles show up and, and all of a sudden there was a crazy surge. I've got to buy a crypto punk or a crypto ape or generative art, these amazing AI artists creating new, new art. And that woke the whole world up to realizing that, ha, huh, there are real use cases for blockchain. Before people thought, oh, this was just the crypto guys playing with the crypto guys, right? But now, Every major company in the world is looking at how do I use these, these tools, this crypto idea, this community, this idea of the scarcity to enhance my business. So Visa, Visa is a half a trillion dollar company. They power more transactions than any other company. Uh, they went out and bought themselves a crypto punk. And when I asked the CEO of Visa why they bought a crypto punk, he said, hey, we want to send a message to the community that we want to be part of it to this crypto community. They told me right now, on a normal day, every Visa cardholder uses it less than one time. Hmm. And they think in 10 years, it'll be 10 times all the growth coming from buying digital goods, digital shirts, digital collectibles, digital art. And so for the first time since I've been in crypto, we see real companies, if they're sports teams, uh, you know, uh, uh, brands like Chanel, uh, all saying, hey, I need to be part of this economy. And I think you're going to see it all over the place. With 100% with certainty, I promise each and every one of you, in 10 years, your health records will be NFTs. And you'll finally go to the doctor, and you'll pull out your phone, which is your wallet, and you'll have your health records, and you'll be able to share them with the doctor instead of having to call 16 different places. Anyway, so that's the excitement that the world woke up, and that's why crypto prices have gone up so much this year, uh, right? You just had a huge year. If you were long crypto, you know, you're, you're feeling very good about it. A lot of it is because the world finally noticed there's a use case, and there are lots of them. But NFTs was really the wake-up call. I want to respond a little bit to some of that, which is true. Um, at blockchain.com, we've had over 80 million people sign up over the last decade. Um, there's a cultural phenomena in art and music and in sport. There's a financial phenomena around how do we tool all of our systems to be more efficient and digitally native in the first place. And uh, there's incredible innovation and investment happening in this industry. And it's recycling. Um, we're learning lessons and we're getting faster, better, and cheaper. And if we look at how technology, which is a true driver of history, has evolved over the past 100 years, it's pretty obvious, to me at least, that over the next decade, the internet will be the greatest contributor to GDP in the world. The time to invest in humanity and the time to invest in enabling technologies that bring wide-scale utility in the financial services industry is right now. And I can speak quickly for my firm. We've seen the fastest growth ever in the adoption of wallets. This is really important. Wallets are tools that enable you to passport into this future of new financial services. You can send, receive, secure, trade, and exchange digital forms of wealth. Sometimes those are cryptocurrencies, sometimes they're stable coins. They allow you to remit money instantly, basically from Dubai to the Philippines or from the United States to El Salvador, which is a really interesting example this year. We now have a country that has adopted a digital currency as also part of their national currencies um, obligations. And so we expect to see more of these things going on, but it's a really incredible year for crypto. And uh, we'd love to see more participation from everyone here. Does it matter about the regulatory systems? Because that's one of the issues that people always bring up uh, with this issue. I wonder what matters and, and also who's doing it really well. You know, I do think uh, if you look back in time as a U.S. citizen, one of the reasons why the United States led in the Internet of Information development is because there was regulatory clarity, regulatory certainty based on laws passed in the 90s. 
And what you're seeing now in blockchain and crypto, I think, is a similar dynamic where you have a, a category of countries that really have been on the leading edge of providing that clarity and certainty. So investors and entrepreneurs like you have on stage today can build companies with that clarity. Uh, countries like the UK and Singapore and Switzerland and Japan and even the UAE have been really leaders in providing that regulatory certainty and that regulatory clarity. You're seeing more and more countries lean into that. Now, that isn't to say there are some countries, as I'm sure many are here are aware, like China, that have taken a more negative view on occasion. But I think the long-term trend, as Mike was described, you step back and think about over the last six, seven, eight years that all of us have been involved in this industry, you see a very positive trend line overall that I think is going to continue to grow globally because of the benefits to consumers, to the benefits of, of constituents that governments are representing, whether it's remittance costs in key corridors. Uh, it's just, it truly is the democratization of money, finance, allowing more people to come into the system. Interesting. Did you want to follow up? Sure. Listen, you know, any new industry uh, that changes the world often creates a bubble, right? You had a railroad bubble, you had an internet bubble. It creates a bubble because the story becomes so clear to people, I, I got to be part of it. And when you have these, these manias, these surges of enthusiasm around something, you often get fringe players on the side that, that take advantage of that enthusiasm. And so it's regulators job at times to police against that. And they're usually not great at it, but so they have a real role to stop the charlatans, to stop the bad actors. I would tell you the core of this movement and most of the players aren't bad actors. Um, and that we're not in a bubble yet. We had a little mini bubble in 2017. Now we're actually in a movement and it's a movement that's gaining speed and, and legitimacy. And so the crypto community, the, the, the guys on stage and our, our brothers and sisters that are building these businesses didn't do a good enough job, certainly in the United States, but everywhere, educating politicians, educating, educating uh, regulators. That's all changing. And so I'm confident that certainly in the U.S. over the next 12 to 18 months, we get better regulation, more clarity. And I'm confident because crypto is really popular, right? There are over 200 million people on earth that own part of a Bitcoin. There has never been a security or not a security. There's never been an asset owned by more people at once. And so recently in the United States, the government try to jam in to a piece of legislation uh, some language that will be very bad for the crypto community. And over a weekend, the crypto world shut DC down with phone calls to senators, with, with emails. And it was the first time DC realized, oh my God, there's 60 million crypto voters in America. And so certainly in the Western democracies, the crypto what about voting in China? Law. What about the recent actions of China? Listen, China has a very different view on how they think the world should go, right? China citizens are willing to give up a lot of their personal freedom for the collective good. And they have a president, President Xi, who went from a world where China was becoming more and more part of the global community to saying, I'm in charge. You can call him an emperor, you can call him what you want, but Xi has taken a very hard, fast view that his view of China should be the China that's going to happen. And so anything that threatens the Communist Party of China is bad right now. And they saw crypto, which is about freedom, which is about empowering individuals, which is about transparency as really bad. If you want to be in charge of everything, you don't necessarily want so much transparency. And so for the rest of the world, you've got to decide what kind of society do you want to build? Do you want to build a society where freedom is important? Or do you want to decide, build a society where one guy owning all the power is important? I want to give you guys one quick question. Give me your best example of blockchain or crypto for good. We've got 39 seconds. Sure. Um, so anyone that wants to speak about this or how institutions can get involved, I'd love to chat with you afterwards. But how it's for good, anyone in the world right now can download a piece of software that can enable them to become financially sovereign. If you think about that for just a second, they can basically build financial capabilities in their pocket on their smartphone that gives them access to the same things that people in Canary Wharf or Wall Street or Singapore have, but anywhere on the planet, regardless of the circumstances of their birth. So if we want to unlock a lot of human latent potential, let's give them tools to build wealth. The for good that I think about today, where Ripple has focused, is really on reducing the friction as measured in cost and speed of payments 
particularly around cross-border. I think people forget that remittance costs, which really are for populations of immigrants that can least afford that, can be 600 or 700 basis points on average globally. And so the for good is if we can bring that from six or 700 basis points and taking days and having lots of errors to taking seconds and costing 60 basis points, the for good, particularly for those segments of populations, is a lot of good. Hmm. Mike? I would say that crypto started as a movement where a group of people say, we don't really trust the center. We don't trust these governments, big organizations, big banks anymore, right? It started from a breakdown of trust. And where it's for good is it's a Gen Z and millennial revolution where they're building new systems of trust, trust built with transparency. And so in a world that's balkanized, like our world has, where politics are harder and harder, both in the US and globally, crypto is kind of a pan political movement uh, that's built around this concept of trust and it's trust through transparency. And I think that's a spectacularly important idea. Fascinating. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I want you to actually, when you're backstage, have a listen to this next section because uh, crypto and blockchain can play a really important in, the, in counterfeiting and counterfeit goods as well. And I know you know about that. F I encourage you to follow up with hands later. Thank you very much. Thank you.